The next speaker that I'd like to invite up, and Dave, why don't you come and plug your computer in while I talk, um, is Dr. Dave Destenno. Um, Dave Destenno does some of the most creative, clever work on the role that experiences of compassion play in, plays in social interactions. He does those wonderful studies uh, where you tell participants some fantastic research premise and then measure something altogether different using believable actor confederates and measures that would elicit suspicion from any of us in this room but are easily digested by unsuspecting undergraduates. <laughs> um, Dr. DeSeno is a professor of psychology at Northeastern University and the director of the Social Emotions Research Lab. His work focuses on the role of emotion in social cognition and social behavior. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, he, uh, he addresses questions like how do emotions affect moral decision making, risk assessment, prejudice, trust and cooperation, pro-social action and altruism. He recently published an op-ed on the science of compassion in the New York Times, which serves the very important role of translating and scaling the important work that all of us in this room are doing to popular audiences in the interest of perhaps affecting some of this broader social change that, uh, that Stephanie was telling us, uh, was imploring us to, to observe and uh, consider. So with no further ado, uh, I'd like you to welcome Dr. Destenno. Thank you. I'll talk fast. I know we're running late. Anyway, my lab, um, well, first, thanks to Emiliana. Thanks to Jim Doty. Thanks to everybody else for putting this together. I think it's, it's, it's a huge benefit both for the scientific community uh, as well as for um, practitioners and the public at large. Um, my lab focuses on the interplay of, of human character and human morality and emotional responses. And currently, a major thrust of that work is centered on uh, the study of compassion. And so what I want to do in the next few minutes is give you a brief overview of the theoretical perspective we use to study human character and human morality, and then talk about how that um, relates to the causes and, and consequences of compassion. So let me just start by saying I, I think most of us have this idea that character is this fixed, rigid thing. And what I want to do is begin to challenge that idea with you and to suggest to you that that idea may in fact not be the case. The origins of the term character come from um, an ancient Greek word that I won't try to pronounce, but that referred to the uh, marks that were indelibly stamped on coins. Once you had those marks, that was who you are. Once your character was formed, that's who you would be. And the idea that most of us have of this is that we have the motif of the, you know, the two shoulder-sitting angels, one that would speak good and one that would speak evil into our ears. And if we went along and, as we grew up, learned to listen to the good one, then life would be good, we would be a good person, and we would, you know, uh, have a wonderful existence, and the opposite would go the other way. The one thing we do know from decades of scientific research is there's just one problem with that view. The data do not in any way support it. Human character, human morality is a lot more variable than I think any of us would have imagined um, 15 to 20 years ago. And so what I like to argue is for a different way of understanding what human character is and how it works. And really, I like to think about it as a battle between two types of mental mechanisms. And I use Aesop's fable characters to, to, to argue this. One's focused on the short term and one's focused on the long term. It's not good and evil. It makes no sense unless we're talking about extreme pathology to say that the mind has evil mechanisms. What evolutionary purpose would that serve? Rather, what I argue is that we have mechanisms that focus on getting me to what I want in the here and now versus getting me what I want in the long term, uh, symbolized more by uh, the ant than the grasshopper. Um, because some things that are better in the long term take effort in the short term. And in terms of compassion, what that means is sometimes it can be very difficult to help somebody in the short term. But the long-term gain for both ourselves and society is there. And if we don't engage, it, engage in it in the long term, we're going to pay the price. And so how we act, what our moral calculus is in any one moment, is going to be determined by where that scale is when the opportunity to act faces us. Now this leads many people to think that we have two minds, an old mind and a new mind, and we do have an old mind and a new mind, metaphorically speaking, but it's not the case that most people think that the old mind is driven by emotional responses and is focused on things that I want right now, like donuts and sex and beer uh, and sleep. Uh, and then we have this new rational mind that comes in 
and saves us from this evil emotional mind. What I'd like to remind people is that some of the most horrific elements of human behavior in history have occurred through rationalization. And so it is certainly not the case that the new mind is perfect. Rather, what it is is that we're solving this problem, something economists call intertemporal choice, which is long-term versus short-term trade-offs. We're trying to solve it on both levels. We're trying to solve it on a gut, much more automatic level, and we're also trying to solve it on a reason level. And those two levels can come into contact and in, in, into, sorry, into conflict at times, and that's where some of the most interesting behavior comes. And so what I want to argue is it's not the case that kind of these more intuitive emotional responses are evil. They're trying to solve the same problems of being a social species uh, that we've had for much longer than we've had the cognitive architecture to think about it uh, abstractly. Now, the idea certainly isn't new. If we look back to Adam Smith, the idea is there. And since if, if Paul read Darwin, I'll read to you Adam Smith. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others. Of course, Adam Smith also believed... Uh, in the, uh, in the invisible hand and everything would be fine in economics. But I think this point is, is, is well taken that the view is longstanding that we have these intuitive responses even outside of rational thought that uh, interest us in the caretaking of others. Now for a long time as scientists we've tended to focus on only one side of this equation. We've tended to focus on uh, the side that says well you know human beings are self-interested actors, right? The accumulation of resources was where the action was at. Kindness, for lack of a better word, was a strategic facade that we used to basically satisfy our own desires for um, self-aggrandizement and accumulation of resources. There's only one problem with this view, though, and that is really acting selfish and indifferent to the uh, needs of others doesn't always lead to the best outcome. Many people have realized this in many religious traditions. I think um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is one of the best proponents of this view. He often states love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. So kindness cannot just be a strategic facade that we use to satisfy selfish goals. Rather, it's something that is innate in us, as is selfishness. In the scientific realm, we're seeing more and more evidence of this. This is um, Martin Nowak at Harvard, who's got wonderful mathematic, mathematical models based on, um, on um, evolutionary um, biology, suggesting that if you look long-term, winners don't punish. Yes, you can punish people in the short term to get them to do what you want. But in long term, both in, in terms of the individual's gain and in terms of the society's gain, not punishing individuals, but trying to gain appropriate behavior through nonviolent uh, methods leads to better outcomes for the individual and the society as a whole. And so what I want to argue is that we have within us both selfish and selfless short-term and long-term impulses, and they operate at both the conscious and non-conscious levels. Which of those emerge at any one time is often influenced by the world around us. And what I take as my job is to try and figure out how can we nudge, to use um, Thaler's uh, wonderful term for that, how can we nudge the right responses to increase the responses, the compassionate responses, the pro-social responses that will give us the best outcomes. And so let me give you briefly some examples of, of, of why I think it matters with compassion. So I'll start in kind of reverse order talking about the consequences of compassion and then what can we do to cultivate it? Um, there's been a view in many religious traditions that compassion is this moral force that can radiate outwards, that can actually work to uh, decrease punishment and increase forgiveness, even of other individuals who aren't seeking forgiveness themselves. And that's a really important question, and it has huge cultural implications and societal implications, but it's one that we haven't seen much scientific um, study of. And so I want to tell you about a study that we've done that uh, I think um, focuses on this. But it makes th theoretically good sense. We know that humans are uh, all too ready to engage in kind of tit-for-tat aggression. And so it makes sense that we're going to have an emotional response that's pro-socially oriented that can work to, to stop the spiral of increasing regression aggression, and that can actually work to help us um, 
back out of that spiral and start over. And so a study I'm going to tell you about um, was spearheaded by um, my student Paul Condon, who is here, and he's going to be presenting a poster on it tomorrow. And so I don't have time to go through all the specifics of it because it would take too long, but I, I urge you to go see his poster and to talk to him about it because it was his brainchild. Um, the way this study works, uh, you know, everybody in my, in, in my university calls us the lying lab um, because we use, we use, we use deception in, in, in some ways not because we think it's fun, but because decades of work have shown that if you ask people to tell you what they think they're going to do, what they're going to feel, they're really poor at it. And so if I ask people, are you going to be compassionate, they'll do one of two things. They'll tell me yes, knowing full well they wouldn't. Or they'd say yes, believing they would. But when push came to shove, they actually wouldn't. And so to really understand behavior, we put people in these situations that, that are real to them. And so to make a long story short, this study worked um, in the following way. We would bring people to the lab um, with two confederates, one who I'll just call the cheater and one who I'll call the inducer. And we told them we're looking at a, a study looking at um, the relation of mathematical ability to taste perception. We gave them a rationale for why that made sense, even though it doesn't. Um, and... Uh, to make a long story short, they, they had to solve these mathematical problems. And the more they solved, the more money they would get. Um, and what happened is, in some of the conditions, the person who is, who is labeled the cheater would cheat. And they would see him cheat, and they would know he cheated. Uh, and the experimenter wouldn't because he was out of the room. And this person would make far more money than anybody else. Uh, and they got really mad at him. In fact, this, this is actually adapted from work by Francesca Gino uh, and Dan Ariely. Um, and uh, we would then give them the chance to punish this individual. Because the next part of the experiment was this taste perception part. And we told them, well, you know what? We don't want to bias any things. We're the experimenters. So we're going to have you guys um, prepare taste samples for each other. It just happened, right, that, that one of the taste samples that, that the subject was randomly assigned to, to prepare was this evil-looking bottle of hot sauce. And again, we didn't create this measure. This, this is a well-known measure of, of aggression. And um, they knew that whatever they put in the cup was going to be placed in its entirety in the other person's mouth. And so they were preparing this for this guy who was Dan, who, who in some conditions cheated and in some conditions he, he, he didn't cheat. And there's a third condition I'll tell you about um, in a second. And so this was our measure of punishment because they knew based on, based on discussions we had earlier and they heard each other talk about what they taste, what they don't like to taste. They knew Dan doesn't like spicy stuff. The bottle is one of those ones labeled with like devils and pitchforks and X's on it. And so by pouring more in, they know he doesn't like it. They know it is going to cause him pain. And so it is clearly a measure of aggression. Um, in a third condition, we had uh, the, the other confederate there who was labeled the inducer, Hannah. Um, she would, she was a great actress, and I, I still can't watch the videos to these days because it makes me feel bad even though I know it was an act. Um, she would begin to tear up with the help of saline drops that we gave her, and she would um, start to sniffle, and the experimenter who was Paul would come over to her and say, what's, what's wrong? And she would start to say, you know, I, I, I feel really sorry about this. I just found out recently that, that my brother is, you know, really, really ill, and I'm really worried, and I can't get home until the weekend, and it's just bugging me, and I, and I, I can't go on with this experiment. And so the experimenter would, would take her out. And through pilot testing, you know, we saw this real-time induction of suffering in front of you, suffering that we can do that is reflective of what somebody might see in a classroom activity anyway. Um, this person's suffering did reliably induce compassion in our, in our subjects. As you can see here, um, when Hannah did cry, the amount of compassion they, they reported in a subsequent emotional measure went up. The interesting thing, though, is what happens to punishment. Well, here's grams of hot sauce. So in the neutral condition, Dan, Dan doesn't cheat, right? And so they know they have to put something in the cup. So they put in, like, a really little amount, like, you know, a little over, you know, two grams of hot sauce. When Dan cheats, they're really annoyed because he made $20. They ended up making about, you know, four on average. And so as you can see here, they really punished him. But the question is, what happens when they're feeling compassion? Now remember, the compassion that they're feeling is for Hannah, who was worried about her brother. Dan still cheated in exactly the same way. Dan didn't seek forgiveness for his cheating. But yet the simple experience of compassion completely ameliorated all punishment. In fact, punishment in this condition isn't any different than it was in the condition where Dan cheated. If you ask them, they'll tell you they're still angry at him. They'll tell you what he did was still wrong, but they're not willing to cause him physical pain 
to punish him. Now, we have studies going on now where they can actually correct him in different ways, and our sense is they'll be willing to correct him in different ways, because compassion doesn't make you a sucker, right? It doesn't say, yes, do anything you want in the world, right? We still want people to act correctly, but we don't want to increase suffering. And so we take this data to really show us that compassion, for one, is a moral force that can radiate outward to actually mitigate people's desires to cause aggression and pain to others in situations where they normally would do that. For those of you who are psychologists, I'm not going to go into this. Um, you can actually see the, the whole mediation model works, but I'm, t I'm out of that running short in time, so I won't go into that. Happy to talk with you about that later. Um, the second question is, okay, we see compassion has these important outcomes. What can we do to cultivate it, to increase it? And I think the contemplative work is, is wonderful. From my point of view, there are lots of people who aren't going to devote the time and energy to do that. And so what I'm interested in is how can we nudge it along in ways that circumvent this effortful way, and can, is there a way to get there in a much more effortless way? But to talk about this, I always like to, to introduce this, this story, which, which to me is always amazing. Many of you may know the story of the, of the Christmas Eve truce. Um, in World War I, uh, it was um, the uh, British and the Germans were facing off uh, across trenches. And it was a brutal um, situation. But on Christmas Eve, as the Brits were sitting in their trenches, they began to hear singing. And as they looked across the no man's land in between them, um, they began to see lights. And soon they recognized, even though they didn't understand the German, they recognized that the songs were Christmas carols. And the men soon began coming out of the trenches and meeting in this no man's land in between. And they started celebrating together and sharing pictures and trying to make themselves known. And even by their own account, this was uh, a very uh, astounding thing. Here we were laughing and chatting to men whom only a few hours before we were trying to kill Corporal John Ferguson of the Seaforth Highlanders. And the question to me is, is, how do we display such compassion in one moment and such cruelty the next? And can we marshal that? I mean, this is an extreme example. You are trying to kill someone. A half hour later, you're, you're showing them pictures of your family. Now, when you think about this, there's one big question in the world. The world is full of people who need help. We can't help all of them. And so the, the way to understand how we can cultivate compassion is to understand how do we go about figuring out, or how does the mind go about figuring out who it is beneficial to help, given that we can't help everyone. What I want to suggest to you is that one ancient metric that the mind uses to do this is something that is called similarity. And similarity, as Amos Tversky has well shown, is something that is, is on an elastic metric. We can define it in lots of ways. So when Paul Ekman talked about family compassion and stranger compassion, I don't think those are different things. I think all we're talking about is a different metric on how we're defining similarity. And we always do it based on family, but there's lots of other ways that we can do it. And so what um, Pierre Carlo Valdesoldo and I wanted to do when we looked at this is say, how far does this bias exist in the mind? If I told you that on the battlefield an American soldier came across a wounded American soldier and a wounded member of the Taliban with the same injuries, and he or she felt more compassion for the American soldier, you probably wouldn't find that very surprising. These are two groups in conflict. But what we wanted to show you is how deeply this, this um, effect of similarity is embedded in the mind, that it doesn't really relate to long-standing conflict. It's something much deeper and therefore something that we can leverage much more easily. And so we wanted to argue that the stress really depends on the eyes of the beholder. How much your suffering, how much I perceive your suffering to be is dependent upon how similar I think I am to you. And one way we wanted to study similarity is using an ancient metric um, of simple motor synchrony, right? You see this in all types of rituals. You see it in sports. You see it in conga lines at weddings. You see it even in, in animals working together in schools of fish. When organisms move in unison, it's a marker that those two, at least for now, for this moment, their joint goals, their joint purposes have become one. And so can we use that to actually begin... Sorry. This keeps settling on me, to show um, compassion. And so what we did, we brought people into the lab and we told them, we're doing a study on music perception. Please sit down, put on these earphones. And in front of them were sensors. 
And as they sat across the table from each other, all they had to do was tap their hands as they heard musical beats. Now, the only manipulation we had was whether those musical beats were playing in sync, resulting in them moving their hands in sync, whether they were randomly out of sync, so that they would be you know, doing things in a random fashion. One of the people was a confederate. One of the subjects was a true participant. They didn't talk. They didn't do anything else except tap across from each other. That confederate then went to another room. We told the subject, you know, we're also developing this new way of assigning people to experiments. And we want your view on this, um, being that you're a member of the particip participant pool. So, so would you watch it and just tell us? And they said, sure. And so they saw us go into the room, and, 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 and we would make a long story short, which I, since I'm running late, I'm not going to tell you the, the, the specifics. But what this happened is they would, they would end up seeing the person they were either tapping their hands with get cheated by someone else or not. And by cheating here, what it means is a coin was supposed to be flipped to decide who got to do one of two tasks. There was a really short and fun task, and there was an awful, onerous, hour-long task that had to be done. Um, and what they would see is one of the other confederates not flip the coin and assign himself the good task, meaning the person that they were just tapping their hands with got stuck doing this god-awful, onerous task. And then we left them alone, and they were filling out some questionnaires, and the computer would simply ask them, you're all done. As you've seen, there are two tasks. We don't really care who does them. We just need to get the work done. And so if you would like to help, please go find the experimenters and tell them. Now, we didn't want to ask them to help because there's too much demand in that. So they just had a computer that said, if you want to, they already had their credit, they already had their payment, go find the experiment, go find Paul or me, or, I'm sorry, Carlo or me, and tell them if you want to help this guy. And what we would then do for those who came and wanted to ask to say, can I help that person who got stuck doing this long task, we simply timed how long they spent working. Now, they didn't see the other person. They were working on their own. All they knew is that the more work they did, the less this person would have to do. And there wouldn't be any benefit from it because the other person wouldn't actually see them. The other person would benefit that he would suffer less from having to do the work, but he wouldn't know it was them who actually helped him. And so they had to decide, are they going to help them or not? Um, what we found is that simply tapping your hands in unison did what we thought it would do. It, increases, it increased people's perce uh, perceptions of similarity to the other. Now, if you ask them, why did you feel more similar? They didn't know. They would say things like, well, I think we kind of have the same personality. Or, well, uh, you know, he reminds me of my brother or something. But it was always the same person across all conditions. They never talked. They never interacted. And so it wasn't that. This was just a non-conscious mind responding to motor synchrony, giving the conscious mind the sense of similarity. And so post hoc, the conscious mind created a rationale because there had to be one. But interestingly, if you look at how much compassion they felt for this person. Now remember, the person was screwed over the same way. He was suffering the same plight of having to do the same god-awful task. So if the, if the barometers of morality, if the scales of morality were fixed, these should be equal. But how much compassion they felt for that person was dependent upon whether or not that person tapped in unison with them and they felt similar to him. The more similar they felt to him, the more they felt his pain. If you look at how much this affected helping, to me this was an astounding effect. 17 out of 35 people who tapped in unison, they were willing to go help that guy. Six out of 34 would help when they didn't tap. So basically simply tapping your hands increased helping by over 30%, which you think about scaling that to a, to a societal level is huge. If you look at how much time they spend helping, this is huge. Right? This is a god-awful task that, you know, that most undergrads don't want to do. So those few in the asynchronous test said, oh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll kind of help. They didn't stick with it. But if you tapped in unison, if you thought this person was similar to him, you felt more compassion for him, and you spent a lot longer time. These are seconds. So you spent many more minutes helping him. And again, for those of you who, who like to see um, path models, this really was guided by synchrony. So if you tapped your hands in sync with this person, yes, you felt more similar to him, and yes, you liked him more. But the interesting thing was, it's not that you liked him more, that that's what made you help him more. It didn't matter how much you liked him. That didn't predict helping. It was how much compassion you felt for him, which was modulated by how similar you felt to him, which directly impacted your helping. So what this suggests to us is that moment-to-moment -moment human character is flexible. And we have lots of other studies looking at lots of other 
types of human character changing moment to moment, whether it's hypocrisy or arrogance or fairness. But here, at least, we can see it with compassion. And I think what this suggests to us is that compassion need not always be something that has to come from the top down. We don't always have to work to remind ourselves and to work hard that we should be good, that we should help other people. Rather, what this suggests is that we can cultivate compassion effortlessly from the bottom up by simply changing subtle factors in the way we think about other people. There's nothing magic about similarity. There's nothing magic about tapping your hands. It's just one marker of similarity. So in the world I live in, right, this is the conflict in Boston. Um, and so what I tell people is, you know, don't think about your neighbor as, you know, the damn Yankees fan. Think about your neighbor as the guy or the woman who likes Starbucks just as much as you do. And simply recategorizing how we think about people will produce the same results as tapping. What it does is it changes the metric that we're defining our social identities on to enhance similarity. And I think the idea of, of equanimity that, that Thipton Jimpa talked about and lots of other scholars talk about can be seen here in these data. What we're arguing for is arguing to emphasize the similarities between people. The Yankees fan is not my enemy. He and I have similarities in common. And to the extent that we can do that, automatically it becomes easier to feel compassion for these people. In today's society where lots of this is happening on virtual networks, this opens up huge new avenues, right? Think about it with Facebook. What you can do to resolve conflict is to automatically scan people's profiles and present to them information about each other when they're in conflict that emphasizes commonalities. And in so doing, it should actually increase the social harmony and the agreeableness between them. And what that can do, hopefully, is to attenuate things not only like online bullying, but if we do it at a societal level, we can actually deal with um, increasing charitable donations and governmental spending to these individuals who we oftentimes feel are a whole world away and not like us, if we can increase that sense of similarity, then we're more likely to feel their pain even for the same tragedy that has befallen them. And so what it suggests is that compassion and cultivating it isn't really just about willpower and feeling guilt when we don't do it. Right? There are subtle and effortless ways to nudge it and increase it. And for lots of society, that's something that I think hopefully is, is, is a scalable thing and that can lead to, to greater outcomes. And with that, I, I'll end and I thank you for your attention. All right, so um, I'm gonna just do a quick, quick recap and uh, Dr. Doty's gonna come up and follow uh, uh, with some announcements. So I just wanna say what we did was um, we heard from myself and Stephanie a sort of evolutionary theoretical explanations or a host of explanations that can explain the emergence of compassion in humans, the advantages that compassion might afford to survival. And in the words of uh, my mentor, Dacher Keltner, compassion, our, Dar our Darwinian tale of the survival of the kindest. We reviewed constructs like natural selection, inclusive fitness, multi-level selection, and the potential dynamic influences of culture on this process. We then got a wonderful presentation from uh, Tupton Jinpa about the Buddhist philosophical rendering of compassion, which I'll remind you uh, predates all of us by more than 2,000 years. Uh, Jinpa reminded us of the dynamic directive to continue this pursuit towards arriving at a consensus model or definition of compassion. That's one of the very purposes of this gathering. He reminded us of what compassion is not and explained what some of the key practices for com cultivating compassion are. Um, and um, discussed from a Buddhist perspective um, what some of the basic assumptions are uh, about compassion, about the arising of compassion. We then got the privilege of hearing from Steve Porges and his description of the expressly mammalian affiliative prosocial function of the vagus nerve. And gave, uh, he also gave a wonderfully leveled anatomy lesson about the face-heart connection, the portals that regulate state, and the extraordinarily influential polyvagal theory. He explained how important it is to turn off defensive systems to feel 
safe in the arising or potential for compassion. We move forward uh, to Stephanie Brown, who talked about how neural mechanisms that support caregiving and nurturance and, uh, and, and described these mechanisms and explained how they relate to stress and the potential for compassion. And further, how having a compassionate orientation relates to the potential for caregiver behavior, or caregiving behavior to incur benefits upon that helper, that person who was a caregiver. And finally, we got the privilege of hearing from Dr. Desteno about how compassion and some potential properties of real life contexts like similarity and incidental elicitation of compassion can influence social behaviors like helping or punishment, which sheds light on how we might conceptualize compassion in a social functional context. What I'd like to say is, what a marvelous and amazing overview of the origins and conceptual models of compassion. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to reschedule Leah's guided exercise because I think everybody's hungry and needs to take a break. And I've deprived you of an active Q&A. Uh, I apologize profusely for that. But again, I want to encourage you to please find the speakers and talk to them in person. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Doty. Thank you.